Vodka is just for drinking and other things that do not help coronavirus. Hello, I'm Dr. Simon Madorsky, founder and director of Skin Cancer and Reconstructive Surgery Center, SCAR Center, and Appearance Center of Newport Beach. Today, we're going to talk about coronavirus and how to stay safe. Normally, this podcast would be about skin cancer, plastic surgery, and all things appearance. But given the current topical issues of the day and the need to know more about coronavirus, we've dedicated the next episode to prevention. How do we prevent coronavirus and what do we do to stay safe? Social isolation can only go so far. We can stay at home only so many days. Eventually, we'll go stir crazy. We try to avoid crowds when we go out, and we will go out. So if we do that, we need to stay six feet away from other people. Six feet allows people to sneeze and cough and aerosolize the droplets of their mucus and sputum without minimizing our chances of inhaling that and getting infected with the same virus. So six feet of separation is great for those outside, but it's okay to be close to your family. Hug your children, hug your wife, hug your husband. We do prefer, however, outdoor activities to indoor activities if you're going to pursue some activities outside of your home. Of course, if you're going to go to an outside venue, I recommend staying seated outside with chairs spread further apart to minimize the indoor recirculation of air and possible someone else sneezing less than six feet away from you and you inhaling those viral particles. And sunlight is good as long as you can get it. Here in Southern California, we're lucky in that regard. Sunlight, as we have shown in the first podcast, has extra ultraviolet rays A and B and heat, which minimize the duration that the virus can survive on surfaces. But what can you do outside of social isolation and avoiding inhaling viral particles? Well, of course, you all know the basic of hand washing. It's 20 seconds. It should be pretty vigorous. You can sing a happy birthday song or any other song that you think of. I couldn't think of any other song to sing, by the way. But don't forget the third hand. The third hand is actually your cell phone. Your cell phone is contaminated with whatever is on your hands. We look at it pretty much every five minutes of our day. So if you're going to wash your hands and wash the germs and possible virus particles off of your hands, you need to wipe down the phone. Alcohol wipes are sufficient for that. Wipe front and back. Maybe once a day, take off the cover and clean vigorously with Lysol or Clorox wipes to get the inside of the phone disinfected. But after every hand washing, wipe down your phone. The other big thing is touching your face. Um, The way of transmission of this virus is obviously from hand to your nose and to your eyes. But how do we stop touching the face? Well, there is a concept known as habit reversal training. And for me, uh, I put tape on the fingertips of my hands. And uh, when I'm at home, it actually taught me not to touch my face as much. You can also wear gloves, perhaps, if you're a habitual face toucher, which all of us are. So a glove on the hand may um, teach you to avoid it. Then when you're without gloves, that habit shall sustain itself. But the habit will come back. You'll fall off the wagon and you need to teach yourself again. You should probably do this daily to keep your hands out of your face and out of your nose. All right, so home is our sanctuary. We're going to disinfect it. We're going to clean it. But we have home invaders and they can bring the germs from outside. I'm not talking about our teenage kids, but we will talk about them shortly. When we have visitors enter, have them enter either through a garage and wash their hands right away. If not through a garage, direct them straight to a guest bathroom where they can practice good hygiene and hand washing and wiping down their phone. Most importantly, make sure you have alcohol wipes or disinfectant wipes in that bathroom next to soap So the third hand could be sanitized and disinfected as well. If someone is symptomatic, and we know what symptomatic is, right? Fevers, viral symptoms such as myalgias, muscle aches, malaise, feeling bad, cough, and sore throat. Keep them out of your home. I'm so sorry, Uncle Joe. You're going to have to go back home. That's the message, and I think most people will accept that nowadays. Package processing. Well, we're all not going to the stores, but we're all shopping on Amazon and Walmart and getting delivery from Costco and others. Those packages can potentially have viral particles. 
I recommend is bring all the packages into your garage or other area outside of your immediate living quarters. Unpackage, take out the outside packaging, discard it in the trash. Inside packaging needs to be disinfected either with wipes or a spray. Let it sit in the, in the garage or near the entryway for a few minutes to finish disinfecting before you bring it in. Wash your hands and you're ready to go. Now, what if we want to go outside? Well, one of the things I recommend is a viral survival kit, cleverly named by me, uh, but it really is a baggie of tissue paper. Why tissue paper? Well, so you can potentially touch and open doors with the tissue paper that you wouldn't want to touch with your hand in public spaces. A pair of gloves or several pairs of gloves if you really need to handle something like in a grocery store when you're shopping. Disinfectant wipes so that you can wipe down your steering wheel or whatever it is that you'll be touching with your bare hands. But of course, let's not forget our bare hands disinfecting. And that is our hand sanitizer. And those are the four things that should be in your viral survival kit. I recommend having a fanny pack or over the shoulder bag that can be easily accessed to get these things. Use this bag when you travel to friends' houses or to public spaces. What about a mask, you ask? There's been a run on masks. No one can find any. Healthcare uh, professionals are trying to get into that supply chain that has been depleted by panic buying of surgical masks. Well, not a good idea for several reasons. Look, if you're serious about protecting your face from viral infection, you need more than just a basic surgical mask. You need a mask that seals around your nose and face in a way that air cannot get in there and viral particles cannot float in. That mask is called N95 mask. But that's not enough. What about your eyes? A simple spray from a sneeze will inoculate you with the viral particles through your eyes and conjunctiva mucous membrane of your eyes. So do you need to wear goggles? Look, the mask and goggles is ridiculous. The only thing you really got to watch out for, unless you're a healthcare worker, but as a regular person going out outside, the only thing you need to watch for is touching your face. If you have the surgical mask on your face, it'll be counterproductive. You'll just touch it, adjust it, and inoculate the viral particles that you may have picked up elsewhere on your face near your eyes. Not a good idea. If you're really serious about disinfection or you're taking care of sick people with suspected coronavirus, healthcare workers use something called CAPR, Controlled Air Purifying Respirator. It's a shield that goes over your whole face, wraps around in an airtight fashion around your uh, neck and jaw. And there's a little electric pump that circulates air through the mask so you don't suffocate on the inside. And that's how you protect yourself from active viral contagion with circulating viral particles in the air. That's for healthcare providers, for healthcare professionals, and not for lay people. So let's forget about the masks and practice safe practices outside. You know, the challenge to all of this has been our teenage children and young adult children. They don't want to be in the house. They want to roam. So what do you do to let them roam? Well, first of all, you tell them to avoid exposure to large crowds or big public gatherings and keep their friend gatherings to a minimum, a few friends at a time. Also tell them if they're going to go out there, have them practice harm reduction, if not isolation from harm. And harm reduction would be traveling with a viral survival kit in a fanny pack or a shoulder bag. And the other thing, I don't know, maybe use some guilt trip. Tell them that please protect yourself from the virus. Maybe you're not going to get that sick, but please don't kill the grandma. Anyway, so that's the uh, moral of the story and that's the guilt tripping. The, so the, the message for teenagers is viral survival kit and don't kill grandma. Now, a lot of people are going to get viral illnesses. They're going to get sick. So are they going to be shunned from society? A lot of us are going to get sick. Are we going to become pariahs in our community? Well, if we look at the data right now, at least from last week, and all of this is changing so rapidly, most of the coronavirus tests have come back negative. In fact, 98% of them have been negative as reported by uh, LabCorp and Quest, the largest lab testing facilities in the United States. This is from last week. Of course, the number of people infected will increase, particularly in the hot zone areas. But for the most part, most people are not going to get coronavirus. So what my hope is that enough uh, test kits will be out there where people with these flu-like illnesses that 
appear as coronavirus will be tested. Then they can wear a big badge or a sticker saying, I am sick, but I don't have coronavirus. Well, that's all in the future. Let's hope for the best for those people who do get sick. The rest of us, there's one more thing we have to watch out for more than just people, and that is beware of the fomites. In the last podcast, we described what a fomite is. Fomite is an object, an object that can retain viral particles on which viral particles can settle that other people touch and that you can touch and transmit it to yourself. So beware of the fomites. Remember, the viral particles can survive at room temperature for up to nine days. The average lifespan of coronavirus is four to five days, and it depends again on temperature, humidity, amount of UV uh, exposed, and the nature of the surface itself. It's Obviously, it survives less in hot environment. Which brings me to one of the ways we can sanitize our clothes, and that is basically in a hot wash cycle or a hot dryer cycle. For 100, at 160 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, virus particles die at 30 minutes completely. All right, now, cleaning of our services, cleaning of the fomites, cleaning where we work, our work areas. Disinfectants are, of course, the way to go. We're all using them. The shelves are depleted of them in the grocery stores, but more are coming. Do not despair. Uh, they keep appearing at the grocery stores and other places, and so we will have plenty of those. The disinfectants that have been shown to work are hydrogen peroxide, Providone iodine, which is betadine, we use commonly for surgical uh, disinfection, that orange paint stuff. Quaternary ammonium, quite commonly used in disinfectants. Also in some disinfectants, it's called benzalkonium chloride, alcohol. And of course, the best disinfectant is bleach, sodium hypochlorite, or alcohol. There's a catch with alcohol. It has to be at least 60 to 70% alcohol by strength. That means you cannot use drinking alcohol. Vodka is not for coronavirus, unless you want to drink your sorrows away. Vodka is only 80 proof, which is 40% alcohol. Now, if you get to Everclear, it is 60% or more by content of alcohol strength. So that could kill coronavirus. Otherwise, isopropyl alcohol uh, it, and any alcohol containing solution, that's at least 60 to 70% alcohol by content. Big surprise to me when I was doing research for this program is that chlorhexidine, commonly known as Hibiclens, that we commonly use in medical settings for disinfection and for surgical uh, disinfection, does not kill coronavirus effectively. A shocker. So I guess if we're really worried about coronavirus, it's either alcohol disinfectant or that orange paint, Providone iodine. Uh, also known as betadine. There's one more factor to disinfection, and that is the time factor. EPA has defined it quite nicely. There's time required to sanitize and time required to disinfect. Sanitize, actually, they specifically define it uh, as a microbial load reduction, meaning bug reduction, by three log. In, in human language, it means three zeros. It means if you have 10,000 viral particles with four zeros has to go to 10 particles with one zero. So that's the three log reduction of particles. Now to disinfect, EPA requires a six log reduction of particles. That means if you have 10 million viral particles, that's one with seven zeros behind it, it has to be reduced by six log. So it has to be reduced to 10 viral particles with disinfectant. And in percentage points, sanitizing has to be 99.9% .9 reduction of the microbial load within five minutes. But disinfection has to be 99.9999% .99 reduction within 10 minutes. So the other thing is EPA does not guarantee that sanitizers will affect viral particles, but it does guarantee that disinfectants will kill viral particles. So look for disinfectants and look for disinfectant protocols. To learn more about this, the EPA website, which will be on our blog and our podcast notes, will tell you specifically which products out there. It's like a huge website. You can search for a product and see how many minutes it takes for any one product to disinfect. Some of these products I haven't heard of, but it's quite fascinating. None of these products disinfect for less than a minute except for pure alcohol type products. So a lot of products disinfect in three minutes, some disinfect in five, 
and some disinfect in 10 minutes, which is obviously the limit that EPA requires for disinfection to occur, to be called a disinfectant. So be careful of what you're disinfecting with. And if you go to the Lysol website, the manufacturer's website, some of their products, uh, it actually shows how many minutes it takes to do sanitization and how many minutes it takes to do disinfection. I looked on the Clorox website, I could not find that information. In our clinic, as a business and as a patient care facility, we also do a lot of things to limit and actually eliminate the fact, the risk to our patients and staff particularly. We utilize visitor entry protocols, as you all know, in terms of your home entry. You ask symptoms about viral illness or the coronavirus specific symptoms, and we all take temperature of everyone entering the facilities. Everyone entering facilities gets a free hand sanitization with a free squirt from the sanitize bottle. Um, we try to limit our visitors and space them in our waiting rooms so that they're at least six feet apart. We also try to uh, limit the spacing of our staff so they don't so they sit at least six feet apart from each other as well. In terms of patient contact, we practice standard patient contact. We wash our hands um, before and after every patient contact. Not only that, the exam rooms get disinfected completely from top to bottom by our medical assistants between each patient, every part that gets touched, not just by patients, but also by the staff. For sick employees, we try to work them from home. And my recommendation for those of you that are wondering when sick employees should come back home, my discussions with infectious disease specialists said, wait for three days after they're symptom free to minimize the effect of them transmitting infections into the office. And certainly you don't wanna have flu or other common colds spreading through the workplace because everybody's going to have to be isolated, everybody's going to go home, and work will come to a standstill. It's also important to have daily leadership meetings. We have it pretty much every day for the last 10 days, where we review our, our sterilization and disinfection protocols, review our employees who may be showing any signs of symptoms, and discuss whether they should work from home or simply be sent home. So there are a lot of things we can do to avoid contagion and avoid getting sick. So overall, it is an avoidable contagion. As long as we use a community-wide approach and we all do our part, I think most of us can escape this. We don't all, or a large part of us, have to get this virus. I am optimistic. Finally, on the brighter side of things, this whole phenomenon, this whole viral pandemic will lead us to have better hygiene. I, for one, has decreased my frequency of nose picking. My goal is to stop nose picking altogether. But that's a lofty goal for me. I am still working on it. But the rest of our hygiene will get better as a society, and that's a good thing. The other great thing I think that'll happen is the public spaces who will want to have customers come back will practice better public disinfection principles, whether it's planes or movie theaters, whether they'll use fogging with anti viral particles or use ultraviolet C rays that are effective and killing viral particles at close contact, we will know in the future. But certainly better disinfection is definitely in the future as well. One of the things that this whole contagion has created is we're spending more time outdoors and less in indoor activities. And that's also a good thing. And finally, the crisis is bringing us together. We spend more time as a family and we'll be stronger as a family and as a society as we go forth and try to keep each other safe. From contagion. Be well, stay tuned for more podcasts on things that are near and dear to my heart, such as skin cancer, plastic surgery, and all things appearance. My name is Dr. Simon Madorsky, and signing off.